coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden radio show today. We're going to talk about, what are we going to talk about today? Um, alternatives to all-purpose flour and the reason why. As well as we're going to talk about how to plant okra. It's not too late to plant okra, and we're going to go over the techniques in which to get the best harvest. And we're going to have host of Growing a Greener World, um, which is on PBS and the Create channel. Joe Lampo, he's calling in from Phoenix today. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to be way earlier than normal. He usually he's uh, from Atlanta, so he's across the country going to call into the show, as well as taking your uh, garden questions uh, via email, phone call, and uh, social media. So all that's coming up right now. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show on 860 AM WNLV and W293CX 106.5, wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening. Whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the Radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, or anywhere in between. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening. Over 900 how-to garden videos, uh, short, long format as well as in-studio videos of this radio program, as well as podcasts. And that can all be found on the radio tab and the highlight tab on the right-hand side. There's a number of ways that you can contact us, but the reason why we are here each and every week are great companies that you'll hear throughout the show, just like... Nacelle Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nacelle is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Ness Alla Kombucha, it's not kombucha. For more information, visit nessala.com. And there you can contact us uh, through Twitter using hashtag TWVG. TWVG. You can email us anytime with your garden questions using uh, the email address twvgradio at gmail.com or you can call into the ivyorganics.com hotline. Ivy Organic is a 3-in-1 plant garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, you go to ivyorganics.com or you can call into our line here with your questions, gardening questions at 414-444-5250. And we have a one talk this week, and then we don't have nothing until August. Where are we going Tuesday at 6 o'clock, Holly? We're going to um, Iguanago to the library. The there. community library there. And we are going to talk t on basics of canning. Uh, Holly will kind of drive that talk, but uh, we were invited there and they uh, were happy to know that we could come. So uh, we'll introduce them to canning, basics of canning. And uh, just a tease, and we'll talk more about it at the end of the show. Next week will be all about canning. We'll have a, a master canner on, talk all about canning. If you never canned before, we'll ease your concerns and uh, a lot that you can do it yourself without any problems. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to, uh, we've got a strawberry patch in our garden about 150 square foot patch and uh we're going we, we do have strawberries and this year it's not that great so we're going to do a little pick your own uh, pick your own farm up there what in, in uh, the cedarburg area today it's uh it's like grafton north of cedarburg and grafton um yeah and if you if you don't have the availability to grow a lot of produce in your grow uh, your area go to a pick your own farm uh it, it's uh it's a great place to where you can um get a lot of produce strawberries peas i think there's a couple apple places uh, around but just do a little research and you can go uh, pick your own and great quality for a great price right uh talking about great prices uh we do want to make mention a couple of uh sales that are running with some of our sponsors till the end of the month the 30th of june uh Ru so, Ru yeah, root yeah, assassin, assassin they, which is a really neat shovel it's uh, oh they have serrated. shovels rakes and other equipment they are right. a supporting sponsor of the program here you can find it under the radio tab on the website but go ahead what, what, what do they have available here so the they have these shovels that are serrated so it's good for getting the roots basically Cut, cutting through roots whenever you're, right. you're um, doing landscaping and if you use coupon code numeral five off five off you can save five dollars on your Order expi that expires June 30th. Yeah, you can find more at rootassassinshovels.com or it's under the radio tab on the website or 844-384-ROOT, R-R-O-O-T. 
R O O T eight four four three eight four R O O T for more information. And also, M I Gardner still running their June forty sale. Say forty percent on anything on the website. June capital J U N E four zero. Uh, at the time of checkout. So we appreciate those companies working with us and working with you to help you get a better deal on products that work great on your garden and your on your property or just uh, for your job. Right. Um, so let's get into the uh, topic here. And Holly's going to kind of drive this one because she knows a little bit more about it than I do. And uh, there's some people that was very interested to know that we we're going to cover this topic of alternatives to all-purpose flour. Now, with that being said, I'm not. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say that I do not bake with all-purpose flour. Because we have all-purpose flour in the house because I do, and there's reasons for that. One is that there's many things that you can bake very nicely with all-purpose flour, like a traditional cake, and and different breads and things. However, there are benefits to using other flours as well, and reasons to incorporate them into your baking or cooking or whatnot. So one is. Um, whole grain flours. So this would include things like whole wheat flours, oat flours, pretty much anything that's whole grain. You can find whole grain pastry flour if you want to play around with that. Um, they are available white. in the city at stores. Right. I mean, you, you, these are not specialty order items. Right. You, you can find them at the grocery store. Yeah, you can find them. Sometimes you have to go to the more organic section, but most of the time a lot of these are in the baking section as well. Now, uh, with, with your whole grains, uh, that's a very large gamut of uh, options there. So why would one choose a whole grain flour versus an all-purpose flour? Well, the whole grain is going to give you more fiber. It's going to be white flour typically will go through your system pretty well, fast. Well, is it white flour or all-purpose flour? Isn't that a bleached uh, product? It's bleached. There's unbleached all-purpose flour, okay. but then there is bleached purpose and, flour. And some people think flour. that bleaching is hurts some of the, uh, right. the the human consumption, it's not good for the body. That's correct. So that's something to keep in mind is the whole grain flours. Those are good for you. Um, if you bake your own bread, that's definitely an option. If you wanted to try like a whole grain uh, pastry flour for some of your more uh, pastries, your sweeter things, then you can try that as well. And, and we've done this. And if you didn't know... You really wouldn't say, oh, well, this is not all-purpose flour. This has a different – there is a slight taste, but, I mean, really it adds better flavor to the, the, the item that you're baking or cooking with. Right. It's not that bland, pretty – I mean, all-purpose flour has, like, no flavor at all. Right. It's just plain. That's it's just why, a filler. Right. That's why, like, cakes taste good because you're just basically tasting, like, the sugar – and whatever else but the yeah, flavor the of flavor whatever yeah. whatever the cake is or whatever you're making with all-purpose flour so that is is one is the whole grain flour now i want to get into to gluten-free and okay what is, can we describe what gluten is because a lot of people hear gluten-free this gluten free what is gluten to gluten begin with? is a protein that's found in wheat and some other grains but it's mostly wheat and many people do have a sensitivity to it there's a legit disease called celiac disease that people have to not have gluten and if they do have gluten they get very sick and now is gluten a new thing or, or no or gluten's over been around for a long time it's just but been... now a lot of people think that they don't need gluten and whatnot but i'm going to touch on that okay. because a lot of people are like hey i i choose to be gluten free no matter what their reasoning is do you know the science behind what happens to your body when you eat gluten no, I'm not a celiac oh, doctor. Oh, you're not a celiac ologist. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it, p people have effects when they right. eat this gluten. There is and a, they a, a, say that if you feel that, okay, like for example, I have a uh, an illness called PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and many people feel that if you cut gluten out of your life, that would make you... Uh, alleviate some of the symptoms. I've never tried it, but if you ever do have curiosities, you can do your own research, speak with your doctor, whatever you want to, to do. But um, with that being said, gluten-free includes flours that are grains that are that don't contain gluten. So there's oat flours, but some oats are grown in a way that cause, they kind of crossbreed with the wheat type of thing where they could possibly have gluten in them. So you have to look for gluten-free oat flour. Okay. Um, sorghum, sorghum grain is naturally gluten-free. Uh, corn, corn's gluten-free, rice is gluten-free. If you go with a non-GMO. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, so. Goes without saying. But. Right. <laughs> so that is, that is something that you can definitely look into baking with. You usually have to add 
more things because that protein, that gluten protein, is what gives the flour that elasticity. So Which like, you have to add something to substitute that gluten that's missing to make everything go together or do the chemistry in the cake or baking. Right. So you want to keep that in mind that you have to add like, usually it's like xanthan gum or more eggs or I don't know. You have, you have to look at recipes. So that's typically the, the most too, but you'll get a lot of like more, it's more crumbly usually. Like sometimes I make that one almond flour. And everybody knows what that is because you're talking to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That one, that one. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway, so moving on. All right, let's talk about bean flour because maybe people don't think beans as a flour. What, What is that? Well, we're going to talk about nut flours first. Okay, let's talk about nut flours. Okay, so nut flours and bean flours. Well, nut flours are usually going to be on your, they're going to be lower on the carbohydrates. And that's something that I appreciate as somebody who strives to eat less carbs is, uh, is a nut flour. So, for example, like almond flours, hazelnut flour, um, even coconut flour, it has... It has less carbohydrates. Okay. So, but you can still bake with these flours, which is what's nice about them. You have to, you do have to add more eggs. For example, the waffles that I make, they are made with coconut flour, but they're also made with eight eggs. So, you are adding that protein that you're losing from uh, some of the that gluten protein or the, that you're or the not carbohydrates, having, yeah. right? So yeah, so that's nut flours and and uh, uh, bean flours. Bean here. flours. So that's like anything like chickpea flour that's used a lot uh, for people. They use chickpea flour or garbanzo yep, flour. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. You could realistically, you could use pretty much any type of bean flour, but that's the most common. And that's all, but nut flours and bean flours are also gluten free. So if you are striving to stay away from the gluten, that's an option. For so you. if you're if you're gonna bake with these flours, based on the <clears throat> item that you are baking or cooking you may have to add an additional ingredient to fulfill that lack of uh, uh, gluten that the all-purpose flour contains right so you have to do a little research you just can't go with the traditional okay i'm gonna bake a cake substitute one for the other there's some things you might have to additionally add to make the cake actually a cake right and it really just depends sometimes you can buy cake mixes or baking mixes that contain what you need oh Hot- hodgson's mills has gluten-free uh, right. baking mixes right yeah so you have that option. You also, a lot of times you might have something that's going to be more dense. Even with whole grain, you, you're you going to have something that might be more dense. Like I made that cornbread and I used whole grain flour and it was definitely more dense than the more. But it didn't lack more, flavor no. or texture. And, and it really was, it, it made, it was more fulfilling. Right. Um, with that. And that's the thing. It's just something to think about, you know, there's. You know, everything's not so black and white, I guess. And, and then you can also do things like pumpkin seed flour. Right. Pumpkin flour, which you actually dehydrate, dehydrate the pumpkin seeds, grind them up to a powder form, or the pumpkin flesh, dehydrate into a, and dry it and, and dehydrate and grind it up to a powder form. Now, with those, for the, for the pumpkin flour, you have to substitute, you know, you can only add a quarter of the pumpkin flour to the recipe. You have to, you can only use a quarter of that for you know a quarter of that pumpkin flour and then three cups of the all-purpose flour if you need four cups of something you just can't use a hundred percent pumpkin flour or pumpkin seed flour you could try it you can be, try it might but, be interesting but it doesn't work right. that well So that's the thing is sometimes with these other flours you do have to combine things and keep in mind what you are finding recipes and experimenting might be something that you would have to do yeah, so uh, just don't think all-purpose flour is a one-and-done deal. You can certainly explore, look at, do some research, and find a healthier means in order to um, eat healthier, bake healthier uh, when it comes to that. And, I mean, there is some of these things are slightly more expensive than the all-purpose flour. Are, am I right on that or wrong? Or right. does it really matter? Yeah, they are. Sometimes they are. And so you can look for sales or you can buy a lot of times like – Certain stores you can buy, they have a bulk section, so if you want to try something, but you just you want to try a little. You don't have to buy little, five pounds. You don't have to buy yeah, five pounds, right. right. So when we come back, we're going to discuss growing okra. Well, we had William Moss on the program a couple of weeks ago. He said grow okra. Holly's not a fan of okra, but maybe you are. I, I don't mind it. It's, it's fairly, if done right, cooked well and grown correctly, it's not bad at all. We're going to go through the steps of growing okra, which you can still do here in Milwaukee. Gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Mantis 
plant protection professional grade organic pest control solutions. They offer Mantis EC concentrated or ready to use sprays. Certified organic and environmentally friendly insect killer. Gentle on pollinators and other organisms but effective in killing soft bodied insects and spider mites fast. Safe around your children and pets. They also have the cleanest and whitest diatomaceous earth on the market. Visit MantisPP.com to receive a free organic pesticide cheat sheet which is a list of organic insecticides that are used effectively and kills insects fast. Visit MantisPP.com to download it today. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. I support by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more, visit Bobex.com. B O B B. BEX.COM. The international food selection at Woodman's is more than just salsa and soy sauce. We stock a huge selection of foods and ingredients from all over the world. Whether it's Asian, Latin American, European, or Middle Eastern, Woodman's has it. Plus, each store has its own unique selection. With Woodman's, you don't need to visit multiple stores to get what you need. We have everything you need under one roof and at a great price. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautiful. Beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So, if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, Come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5, the Wisconsin Vegetable com. your destination for over 900 garden videos and a whole lot more. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of that. Well, before we get to tree ripe, we're gonna we got a question on the IVorganics.com hotline. Caller, you have a question? Yes, I want to know um, when is it a good time for replanting? The hostas, we've got some, and they're pretty thick. Uh, some of them are ready to bud. Is it a good time now, or should we wait till the fall or spring? Okay. Uh, Holly's going to uh, uh, answer that question. Uh, hostas, uh, one of, they're a, a, a perennial, uh, for those who are not familiar with that. They, they come back each and every year. Yes, Holly? You can, re- you can replant them in the fall, so you can um, break them up and move them around in the fall. And or in the spring. Yeah, you don't want to do it now right before they're budding. Uh, so figure out where you want to plant them in the fall and then divide them then and you will have beautiful host- or, uh, beautiful flowers in the spring for next year. Do they multiply pretty good? Uh, they will They will grow and divide. Uh, they will multiply pretty decent, yes. Right. Uh, full sun is what you want if all possible. So fall is the best time? Yes. After they, after the days are getting cooler and the flowers, uh, the the gross stalks have died back. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead There's and grow some them. There's shade hostas too. Yeah, right. Yeah, but so um, depends on the variety, but yeah, you want to, you want to make sure you do that in the spring or the fall. Definitely, definitely not in the peak of the summer. Okay, that's all I had for this week. Well, thank okay. you for listening. Thank you for your question. Uh, well, w- we have uh, tree ripe 
came and visited this week, and they're also coming again July 13th for well, the, for, for some of the Milwaukee. It depends on where. So you right, need to right. go to tree-ripe.com to find out the schedule because they have things all this week, too. Okay. Um, so that was for our location. So it just depends on where you're at right. in the city, in the state, in the, in the region. Where so, they're going to be. Right. So if you like tree, if you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should go to Tree Ripe Citrus Company. You can pick up twa- top quality produce from tree-ripe.com. They have beautiful, tasty peaches and sweet, juicy blueberries. If you're sick of brand disgusting mealy peaches and lackluster blueberries from the grocery store, you can f- go to Tree Ripe and they have what you need. They come right to a shop in your neighborhood, fresh off the truck. For locations and schedules, you visit tree-ripe.com. And they have locations all over, including Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota. To Illinois and right here in Wisconsin, tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around, which is right now. Yep, and if you want hot to, off the truck, if you fresh fr- off the truck, if fresh off the truck, and yeah. they're also going to different farmers markets where you can get smaller uh, portions. Uh, get there early, and so you don't miss out. And if you forget that, just go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, click on the radio tab, you'll see the big tree-ripe.com logo and website name and you just click there and you can go right to there and find all the information well let's talk about all the information we can provide you for growing okra in your garden uh again holly's not a fan but she doesn't discriminate those who do like okra okra is very good in like gumbo if you've ever had really good gumbo you know it, it, it kind of absorbs the flavors of the other ingredients it's really good mm-hmm. uh, now in my gardener still has three different varieties available and you can use that June 40 coupon for the end of, till the end of the month. Uh, they have uh, red burgundy, crimson spineless, as well as long pod perkin okra. Uh, the burgundy is obviously a, a reddish maroon color, and the other two are green. Now, when it comes to um, okra growing, they, they grow about four to five feet tall, and they produce dozens of okra pods per plant. The thing with the okra pods you you basically have to harvest these on a daily basis because if you let them go beyond uh three four five inches they're going to get very woody and they're going to produce seeds and they're not going to be an edible pod the things with the okra okra is a variety uh that's that's bred for having no thorns some some i believe some native or naturals okra has thorns um the, it's it's more popular in the southern states because of just the, the nature of the, the culture. Right. We, but, grew it, we grew it once. And, and we're growing it again this year, too. I don't know why. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it, it's very easy to grow. Um, and it, so, so one thing to mention is you can buy starts. I'm not sure if they have starts. It, Blue Mills has some starts. I okay. don't know if they still have them available right and now. And you want to keep in mind that it's best if you start them, you want to grow them in peat pots. If you start them at all indoors. Right. I would highly, highly recommend just starting them from seed in the garden. Uh, because they do have this long tap root and do not grow them in containers. Now, you'll see people say, oh, well, I grew them in a container, a big container on the porch and all this stuff. It's much easier. I, I want to make your life as simple as possible and allow you to get okra. Just plant them in the ground. It's so much simpler. Uh, they do have this long tap root, so if you do start them in peat pots or you buy them as a start, you want to be very gentle in getting them out of that peat pot or extracting them if there's multiple plants, planting them in the ground. When you do start your seeds and plant them in the ground, what you can do to accelerate the germination is soak them in whole, uh, whole milk or a milk, any type of milk, for about 12, 24 hours. What that will do is the lactic acid in the milk will eat away of some of that seed coating on the seed because it has extremely thick seed coating, and it will help speed up allowing moisture to get inside of that seed and germinate quicker. Right. So that's a, a a handy tip to accelerate your germination on your your okra there. So since we talked about tap roots, we want to talk about growing in a container. Right. Uh, okra is not advised to grow in a container because of that ta- that tap root. Right. Exactly. If you snap that tap root off, the plant will die. So we don't want to do that. You do want to plant your um, your your plants. Uh, and when the soil is up 65 to 70 degrees, which we're, we're okay, we're good to go on that now. Um, and that's why a lot of people here, if when they do grow okra in Wisconsin, they wait until uh, early summer. And these plants will, ta- will grow um, for 12 to 14 weeks. So it'll be fine. You're not going to hurt the longevity of it. These plants have a certain lifespan. So if you plant them middle of June, early July, you're going to be fine having okra into late summer early fall 
and you want to plant them about uh, one to two foot apart. These things will get towering, four to five foot tall, and expand out like a canopy on a tree. So you don't want them to be so tight to where, one, they compete with each other, and two, they hurt the growth by running into the adjacent plant when it comes to uh, growing it. You want to add a good fertilizer, an all balance fertilizer if you want. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go any more than a 10-10-10 because if you go more than that, you're going to put fertilizer in the ground that the plants are not going to be able to take up. And uh, uh, an aged manure, rich compost is really good. Uh, half a pound per 25 square feet of soil amending or composting is, is a good, good, good uh, guideline. But they really like good and rich soil. And when the seedlings, it, it, you can overplant, and that's what we did on ours. We have a three, foot lo- or a, a three foot long by one foot wide area where we planted our okra. We planted it instead of one seed every foot, we planted two, one seed every six inches mm-hmm. to guarantee we would have something. So we can go in and just snip those plants out in which we don't want to space them properly. So it's n- for, for 99 cents, you get, I, 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 don't, I think you get 50 or 100 seeds. It's very, very affordable to overseed to guarantee because it's a lot easier to snip out those plants that you don't want to space the ones that you have versus okay nothing came up now i gotta wait another two to three weeks for them to germinate all this stuff Overplant, well worth the uh, the investment and again you want to keep these things watered they do love and thrive in hot weather we have moderately decent hot weather so you want to i think i think that's why some people feel they fail here because maybe you started you tried starting growing okra during the wrong, essentially the wrong summer. Right. Maybe it was a cooler summer and that did, was not successful. Put them in the hottest part right. of your garden. If you've got a hot spot in your yard, that's where you want to grow okra. And, and, and another plant that really does well in those type of situations, eggplant. Put those things in that very hot area. You've got to keep the moisture to them, but they will do very well. And what happens, these okras have a very beautiful flower, white or yellow flower that appears. They, they're, they're related to the hibiscus plant. And that flower will appear and disappear, close up and fall off within 24 hours, and that's where that pod will emerge. And those pods, again, two, three, four inches, you want to harvest those on a daily basis, otherwise they will get very woody. You can eat these right away. You can also can them. There are gardeners that do very successful canning of okra, and you can have it all summer long. And some of these people who I've watched who's canned this okra, has canned very large pods beyond what is recommended to be harvested. And because of the canning and the preserving and the moisture, the pods have become very tender in the jar. So when, so from... But let, let's, let, let, if you don't know if you like okra, oh yeah, let's go to the farmer's market, let's go to a, a Woodman's or Beans and Barley, buy some okra. It's not going to have the intense homegrown flavor, but you're going to know if you like it or not because I don't want you to spend time and location and money on seeds and fertilizer to grow a beautiful plant that you later find out, I don't like this. Correct. Uh, because then, then you're going to be upset with yourself uh, because you didn't take the necessary steps to find it. That goes out. with any plant. Well, but true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but okra is more of uh, maybe not the most common. It's not a tomato. You know, so can we plant it now? We can go ahead and plant it now. Put we it just in planted g- some last, last week. week yeah. yeah, put it in the ground, plant it, uh, keep it weed-free. Again, be very gentle with the plants, uh, and they will get very stalky and produce a lot of dozens of pods per plant when it comes to uh, harvesting. You know, uh, and they'll they'll harvest what about twelve weeks or um, about s- two two months. Two months. Yeah. you'll you'll start seeing these, and you'll be able to harvest them for another month, two months, and uh, you'll have a lot of okra. And uh, again, uh, some pests you'll have to worry about is aphids, cornworms, uh, stink bugs, and uh, uh, that's pretty much it. But you just keep on top of it, normal uh, procedure, be aware of the, what's going on in the garden. You won't have a whole lot of issue, and uh, you can harvest it uh, all summer long. Well, what let, we talked about growing okra and using good seeds, let's mow grass with the right equipment. And if you don't have the right equipment... You're not going to enjoy it, and maybe you don't enjoy it, and maybe you will if you have more uh, better equipment to, to use when mowing grass. So do you hear that? That's your neighbors shaking in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of fresh-cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. You can go to aarons.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. When we come back, our good friend, 
and host of PBS and the Create Channel's Growing a Greener World. Mr. Joe Lampa will be with us right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. you say you say nasala kombucha it'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step nasala kombucha <laughs> yeah nasala kombucha makes your body happy nasala kombucha makes your body smile Hot Chin Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour, and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family-owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels, offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more, even kosher and gluten-free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HotShinMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at GreenstockGarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. GreenstockGarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenstockGarden.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Uh, It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more. Well, we've hit a, a milestone here, Holly. At this moment, we are halfway through our 2017 garden radio season. 17 and a half shows in. We have 17 and a half shows to go. And we are, right. and we are working on being back here next year. We're, gonna, we're starting to negotiate with the companies, the sponsors we have, and new companies, uh, new sponsors, to, uh, so we can come back here in 2018. As well as Blue Mouths, the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. They have bulk uh, products, compost, sand, wood chips. They have uh, native plants. They have vegetables still there. They have fertilizer still there. They have decorative items for your yard. And if you don't want any of that and you just want some time to yourself, put your kids over in the enclosed playground. Go inside and have a cup of coffee and relax because they have that too. Where is all that located at? Blue Mills is at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. Or you can go to bluemills.com and call 414-282-4220 just south of Layton on Loomis. And it's it's been family owned since 1955 and the owner works in that building. And you might just run into them whenever you're uh, out and about uh, looking at the products. Well, let's go to the ivorganics.com hotline and bring in our next guest and our good friend. As one of the country's most recognized and trusted personalities in gardening and green living, that passion for living a greener life is evident to anyone who has seen Growing a Greener World, which you can see on the Create Channel and PBS while it's in its eighth season. Joe Lampel is the executive producer and host. He is also an author, home gardener, and advocate for all things green. Welcome to the program, Joe. Hey, Holly. How are you? Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm out in Mesa, Arizona today, and... uh sunny and hot but <laughs> it's nice well i'm glad you're able to fly into phoenix or mesa there i know there was some issues yeah. with uh some aircraft uh, not being able to fly because it's too warm uh, i was wondering uh for people who are scoring at home or by themselves joe was the one that called in on our second show back in march unannounced and unplanned to congratulate us 
on our. That was the first show. No, it was first or second show. A uh, second show, and to uh, congratulate us on the program. Yeah. And um, you know, Joe, you've got like a thousand fourteen things going on every hour, and for you to call in and congratulate us and listen to the show means a whole lot, and we appreciate that. Well, uh, listen, it, it was it was just an honor and a pleasure for me to do that, and I fully support what you guys are doing. I know how hard you've worked to get this show going, and I wanted to support you in any way I can, and I and I will continue to do that. Well, we appreciate that. You you talk to a lot of gardeners uh, through your everyday activities, and in your opinion, Joe, what is the biggest mistake gardeners make, no matter what time of year it is? Well, I think they either don't they, they don't start because they're afraid to make a mistake. Well, let's just say that because. Uh, you know, we we just always want to do it right, but with gardening, it can be a little intimidating to get started. And I think people just wait too long and try to figure it out before they really get their hands dirty. And to me, the best thing you can do and the best way to learn is to just stick a plant in the ground, even if you have no idea what you're doing. But then you just observe what happens, and then you try to figure out how to fix it based on your you know your observation. So I'd say people don't start soon enough, or the, the opposite, I will say this, either they get overzealous and they, they jump in with both feet and they get a little too ambitious and then they find that things are taking off and they are successful, it's not as hard as they thought, and then it becomes a little bit overwhelming. So I guess to sum that up, I would want people to start rather than procrastinate but then just kind of ease into it, potentially. Don't necessarily dive in with both feet right away. Well, and Shauna Coronado was on the program a couple of months ago, and she said you're not a, a gardener unless you've killed about 1,000 plants. So I think right. we're, all, we're all qualified for that. And, and you started as a young child. You jammed a, a, a twig in the ground, uh-huh. and it rooted. Uh, and that's yeah. how you learned. Well, that's a good example, Joey. That's exactly how I learned. I didn't know. In fact, I just jammed it in just because I didn't want to be caught at the moment, not thinking that that broken branch was going to root. But that's the thing about plants. They're so forgiving that I don't think people give plants enough credit for the fact that they genetically want to survive, and they'll do whatever they they need to to try to make that happen. So for me, that's what happened with that broken branch and stuck it in the ground. So good example. So what is the biggest challenge you face being what people may label as being a professional gardener? Well, you know, I think they think that um, I, I just have it all figured out, you know, and I've got this great looking garden all the time and I've, I've got all those problems figured out. And you know what? The more I garden, the more I figure it out. But I, have, I am fond of saying no matter how much you know, there's always more to learn. And I think that especially applies to gardening. And what I love about being a, a long-time passionate gardener, both personally and professionally, is that I'm learning something new every day. And if I'm not learning something new every day, I'm disappointed. So um, for people that wonder about, you know, where I am in this world of gardening and my, with my experience, I would say that, um, yeah, I know a lot more than the beginning gardener, but I hope, I hope there's a lot more for me to learn before I, you know, plant my last plant. And you taught us something that was we kind of knew, but we wanted to reassure that it's okay to say I don't know. You're 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 not you know the eight plus eight in mathematics is always sixteen, right. but that's not always true in gardening. Not always X Y Z equals result. That's a great point. It's not always one and only one answer too. You know, uh, there's multiple solutions sometimes with gardening and. Uh, and, and, you know, I could throw out an answer and probably be right, but I don't think there's anything with saying, look, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that because uh, we, all, we all need to learn from each other. You know, I think I have a lot to offer, but I also get a lot of information from other gardeners. You are a great example of that. So um, to, to, I, I think for any gardener to, to come off acting like they know it all is, is not the way to present yourself because I just don't think anybody knows it all with gardening. Well, I'll, I'll ask you your opinion on this because there might be about four or five different answers. What is a good, low-cost, environmentally friendly way to maintain your lawn? I mean, there's a lot of weed and feed and all this chemical stuff. What's a good way of organically maintaining a lawn that you can be proud of and have a vegetable garden in the backyard? You know what? I think my best um, organic control with my lawn is to cut it high so I don't I cut it at the top end of its preferred growing range. For example, I have a cool season grass. I grow fescue, and I cut it at four inches high. And that's probably twice as high as people would think looks good. But i got to tell you, I have the most beautiful lush green lawn, and I don't, I don't have to apply any chemicals to it. It's very low in weeds because the, the taller grass shades out the weeds, so that helps promote the grass growth. 
And the more the grass is growing above ground, the deeper the roots, and the deeper the roots, the more drought tolerant it is. So, you know, you just create this beautiful self-sustaining lawn just by the fact that you're not cutting it as often or as, um, as severely each time. So now, that and, Now, yeah. correct, correct me if I'm wrong. By cutting it high, you're allowing the, the grass to be taller, obviously, but you're allowing more insects, beneficial and maybe enemies, to live in that and kind of have more of a balanced environment. Well, that's a good. That's a very good point because when I cut it that high, the clover in my grass, which I do not mind at all, has a chance to live there, and it's a legume, so it's gonna it's gonna add nitrogen to my soil, and then the honeybees are gonna come along and pollinate those the clover flowers. They love that, and um, and so I don't do much else. Now I will say uh, once or twice a year I go over there. I go over it with some organite, which is an organic nitrogen source, and that that helps build the soil health and the and the lawn health as well. But, uh, you know, that's an optional thing. I do it, and I, and I think it really improves overall the health of my lawn by building up the overall vigor and what's going on in the soil. But I would not do that with a, with a synthetic chemical. I just don't think that, that helps to build the long-term health of your lawn. Now, with uh, your show, Growing a Green World, that can be found on PBS and the Create Channel, it's syndicated, I think, in, what, 30-some-odd countries, something like that? Yeah, thirty something. Yeah, and uh, so when people watch, they may not realize the behind the scenes, or may- maybe they do realize the behind the scenes. How much time is actually put into one of your weekly episodes? Four days vacation. By the time we get there and film and come home, we getting ready to go out on the shoot, and then when we come back, it's at least ten days and post production, putting the show together with our writers and our editors. Uh, so whatever that adds up to, it's probably um, three weeks, maybe a month of, of work involved to really get the show from conception to completion. For for a 26-minute episode, about three weeks yeah, to a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, for sure. Uh, Definitely uh, three weeks. And, and that's and, and that's uh, and you plus you have uh, for, and if people don't can't uh, miss it on PBS or the Crate Channel they can certainly watch it on GrowingGreenWorld dot com. You have all the episodes of uh, all seven seasons there. That's right. And just back to that point for that question for a second, how long it takes. You know, it's not like we think of an idea for a show and then the next week we're out shooting it. I mean, we we start thinking about these ideas a year in advance or longer, and we put them into a virtual inbox. And our team sits down once a year or twice a year, and we decide, you know, what direction we're going to go the following year. And then we start developing those shows. So, so really, it's probably even longer than three or four weeks when you really think about how much work goes into planning and creating and producing the show. And, and you've got uh, Teresa Lowe. You've got uh, yep. your camera guys, which you, yep. it's a very small group. It's not like you have a, a bus of production people. It's just four or five people, is it not? That's exactly right. When we pull up on location, a lot of times the people will come out and say, well, when's the rest of the crew going to get here? Or when's the truck going to get here, you know, with all the equipment on it? And we travel heavy, you know. We're a lean, mean team, but we're very, very efficient. And we have to be because we don't have a million-dollar budget to do what we do. So we have to all wear a lot of hats and figure out how to do what we do with um, a small crew and with the amount of arms and legs that we have to manage all the equipment. So it's pretty incredible. We are quite the sight when we go to an airport and there's three people and about 18 large containers of equipment. But we've got a real system figured out. So thank God for uh, technology that enables us to reduce the size of all the stuff that we use to shoot in really high quality. Uh, before we let you go, I do want to ask you, what has been your biggest failure in the last year? Because, you know, everybody, we talked about this earlier. Uh, you can't, you're not a gardener unless you've at least failed at something. What has been your biggest challenge the last year? With, with gardening, you mean? Yeah, yeah. What, what's, what, uh-huh. Have you failed at something? What is a plant that you just, it's yeah. your nemesis. You're like, I just can't grow this, but I'm going to keep trying. Squash. Squash. And the reason for, well, and, and it's not that I can't grow the squash. It's the squash vine borer and the uh-huh. squash bugs. I'm not, I'm not out in my garden every day. And if you don't catch the squash vine borer at the moth or the egg laying stage, and next thing you know, the borer is in the plant, and then it's too late. And, uh, you know, for the, for the, trouble that that creates for me and the amount of space that it takes up in the garden i just i don't grow i did it this year again thinking i'd dodge a bullet and i didn't and i had squash vine boar but you know what it's okay because i take videos of that and i take pictures of it and i tell everybody else what to look for and how to look out for it and how to catch it before it gets to become a problem so although it was a mistake for me i don't even look at it as a mistake i look at it as an opportunity to teach people 
what to expect and how to deal with it. Absolutely. Well, Joe, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day there in Arizona to speak with us. For people who want to find more about you and Growing a Greener World, where, again, can we all go and visit? Go to JoeGardner.com. That's my new website with a podcast. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it's really fresh and a lot of great information. We just launched last week. I think people will be very impressed with that. We got some good videos, and just check it out, JoeGardener.com. Can we still get the free ebook uh, through that website? Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. That's where you go to get them. Uh-huh. All right. Well, Joe, thank you very much for for calling in and being with us and sharing some of your garden knowledge, not only with Holly and myself, but our listeners as well. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Joey and Holly. You're thank very you, welcome. Joe. And we'll be back okay. right after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. Gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side and greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh juice, carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from plantsuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. Plantsuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit plantsuccess.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools, and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. Well, what's wrong with Ray from Paint, by the way? Ray from from Paint doesn't doesn't know doesn't, doesn't give you about your garden plants. He's just there to make his his money and then go home. He doesn't care. With your host Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, eight, uh, 900 plus videos, and a whole lot more. Well, if you've got a question, you can feel free to call into the IVOrganics.com hotline and uh, a- ask that, and we will have an answer for that. Ivy Organic 3 in 1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, you go to ivyorganics.com. You can call in right now with your gardening questions at 414-444-5250. We've had a number of questions come in on the uh, uh, TWVG radio, Instagram, as well as uh, Facebook. Right. So uh, one of the questions is, how do I get rid of blossom and rot on container planted tomatoes? Um, they have to plant them in pots because they live in an apartment. Uh, there's a uh, blossom in rot on tomatoes is a deficiency of the um, the lack of calcium that the plant is able to take up, and that's blossom in rot. The, the 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 telltale signs is on the bottom of the fruiting tomato, it's black before it's ripe or in the developmental process of that green tomato. So what happens is the plant can't ha- access the calcium that is available in the soil. And it doesn't have the, the necessary means to develop the rest of the fruit. 
So consistent moisture, damp soil, that allows the science in the soil for the plant to pick up the necessary calcium. Uh, people will add Epsom salt to that, uh, a liquid Epsom salt, in order to help that. There's really no science because Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, not uh, calcium. But just keep your soil moist, and the plant will uh, help. Uh, the plant will l- better develop the fruit of the tomatoes. Now, if you have that on your plant already, it's not going to fix those particular tomatoes right now. It will help reduce the amount on the next generation, that next set of flowers that that plant produces. Right. So our friend Sandy, she's from central Wisconsin. I know she listens often. She wants to know, is it too late to plant cucumbers? Absolutely not. Cucumbers will take 60 to 70 days to reach a mature state. We we plant ours here in Zone 5A Milwaukee area about uh, Memorial Day weekend right right there is about. You can certainly plant those again uh, June, even in July. Uh, you want to figure out if your average last frost date is October 10th, figure out what 70 days is and then back it off another 20, and that would be your last planting. You can definitely plant cucumbers again, no problem. Or I- I plant them now uh, without any problem. And uh, you can do it in a large, very large container. Half of a whiskey barrel would be ideal, the 40 gallon, 50 gallon uh, container, or just in the ground with a trellis, or let them sprawl on the ground. That'll work just well, also. Okay, so then another question is we have some potatoes in the kitchen that are getting sprouts. Um, can I plant them now so they don't go to waste? Um, would I put them in the ground or a container? Uh, you can absolutely plant them right now. Um, it would be best to kind of know what maybe variety they were, um, but you can plant them in the ground. You, the sprouts, is, is long, you know, you can put them in the ground. Containers are okay. You want to bury them. If your container is a foot tall, plant them. Put three inches of soil at the bottom of the container and then fill the rest with compost potting soil whatever and then let them grow that way or in the ground they're totally fine the only thing i I suggest is trying to figure out what variety they are is because potatoes based on the variety there are different durations of growing uh mid a short long or uh, mid or long season potatoes so you can kind of know okay if it's a mid-season that's about 90 days they'll die back you can harvest them Put them in the ground. We've done that. Uh, Worked just fine. And uh, you can go that route. Yeah, just don't waste them. You can put them in the ground. This is kind of a subjective question, but um, I they want to know what, what are my favorite vegetables for container gardening. And I would always have to say root crops. And the reason for that being is because you don't have to worry about compacted, any possible compacted soil, uh, rocky soil, anything like that. If you're just putting a nice, healthy compost in those containers, your root crops will grow beautifully. Right. Uh, what are your favorite vegetables for containers? Well, c- uh, tomatoes, obviously, people will grow them. Uh, again, with any container, and we've talked about this multiple times, the larger the container, the more soil mass there is, the slower that soil dries out. A one-gallon container is going to dry out very much quicker than a five-gallon container. So there's a science behind that. It's just plain physics, I guess, is the, the term used. So keep that in mind. Uh, but car- uh, any root crop really works well, and that's where we've... Um, took our garden to the containers all have root crops beets onions carrots um, uh, turnips rutabagas because the soil is very loose it's very nutrient rich and it's very loose so uh, you can do a lot of root crops very successfully and in a container you don't get disappointed with uh, with container growing uh, root crops okay so another question is can I mulch around my plants with wheat straw? So any plants, uh, she said tomatoes, cabbages, squash, pumpkin, cucumbers, and between the rows of corns and beans, you can absolutely absolutely mulch around your plants with any kind of straw. Wheat straw is fine. Oat, barley uh, straw is fine as well. You would want to avoid hay because you could get some growth from that. There, so, there's weed seeds that yeah, are involved in that one, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, straw is fine. Uh, you can buy that at, at Blue Mills without a problem. And uh, you can also grow in straw bales. It's still not too late to condition your straw bales to do straw bale gardening. And then the follow-up question was, how do I amend clay soil? And we have a video on that we put up this past week on our website at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. You want to speak on that more? Yeah. Uh, if you've got really dense clay soil, you could take compost, put it on top of that soil, till it in, work it in. It's, it's a lot of work to do that. Here's what you can do. Take compost, good organic, rich compost, and layer it one, two, three inches on top of the area in which clay soil is at that you want to emit and allow that to set there. It may take six months, a year. What happens is that that compost permeates that nutrient through rain, water, and insects will actually come up 
through the clay soil as that compost works into the clay soil, and it helps break apart the, the molecules and, and the, the particles inside of the clay that is very nutrient dense, but they're so lo- tightly bound that it's hard for anything to grow. So by that compost just sitting there six months, whatever the case is, it's going to naturally loosen up that soil and enrich that soil with that compost you put on top of it. So it works very well. You don't have to till it. You don't have to work it in. It works very well that way. Just it, I want it to be simple, and that's how the simplest way to go about amending clay soil is. Okay, so another question is my rhubarb is green with a little red on the stalks are they ripe to harvest will they ever be fully red and the question is probably not there's some varieties of rhubarb that is going to be red at the base but not fully red it just depends on the variety and you don't want to harvest any stalks during the first growing season so your plants can become established and then if you are going to harvest you want to make sure they're about 12 to 18 inches long and and that when you do that that you you kind of hold it by the, not really the root, but like the base, and then you twist them gently. You just don't want to go yanking your, your rhubarb off of the base of the plant. Right, and um, we, we're ready to harvest some, and, and you know some are very pretty red, and some are not very red. We do have a problem with our rhubarb in our container. The central stalk is a uh, hollow, and I've got to figure out what's going on with that. There's a side shoot that's not hollow, so that's some issues that we've got to deal with in our vegetable container garden for the rhubarb what is eating my squash leaves Uh, this is a problem that some gardeners are having now and it can be a variety of different items or different insects that are eating those uh, squash plant leaves right so they didn't send a picture with this so we don't really know what 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 the problem was, but we have kind of a general solution. Um, You can look around for squash bugs or other beetles. Um, If you don't find them, you can come back at night and look for slugs. Otherwise, at the base of the the infected, infested squash plants, you can take um, like a homemade squash bug spray. And so you put a few drops of liquid castile soap into a spray bottle and then fill the water with with water. So I would say probably like, I don't know, like maybe a teaspoon of this soap and then for like each pint of water, or yeah, each pint of water, um, and you spray at the base of the plant and the undersides of the leaves. That spray is good for a lot of different things. It's not going to harm your plants. Uh, another question that came in on Instagram, and you're welcome to send questions uh, via any of these social media platforms. You can go to the website and just yeah, and submit a question there. I need advice. Something is attacking my bean seedlings. What could I use to get rid of them? What is it? And I want it to be safe for my kids, my uh, the animals in the yard. What can I do? Well, uh, we, we're having this issue as well. It's kind of a universal uh, problem. From what I can find, there's a number of insects that are possibly eating these bean leaves, uh, slugs, snails, or cutworms. Um, that's just some of them. But the end result is determining uh, what kind of bug it might be, which can be difficult if you can't find it. So you can do two things here. You can put use coffee grounds around the base of your plant that's going to uh, uh, irritate the animal that's going up to the stalk and eating the leaves, whether it's slugs, snails, cutworms, whatever the case is. Or you can also use diatomaceous earth from uh, mantis plant protection and put around your plants. And what that diatomaceous earth will do, well, it's, it's a terrible thing, but it, it gets on the, on the soft-bodied insects and dehydrates them and kills them. Uh, so that works as well. I, I go with the coffee grounds first and then do the whole grain uh, or the, the uh, diatomaceous earth as a secondary option if the, ho- if the coffee grounds do not work. What else do we have this week? Uh, my balcony faces west and a bit north. What kind of plants in a patio container garden? Um, I think you could definitely do greens. Greens. What, um, what is your saying about the... Um, if it's if you grow it for the roots or the fruit, you want full sun, which is about six to eight hours of full sun. If you grow it for the greens, you can plant it in shade, which would be less than six hours. Now, with the uh, container, you can get away with some, some fruiting crops. Uh, tomatoes, it's a hit and miss. Beans, beets, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, all can be grown in that partial shade. Not as successful as full sun, but it can be done if you're limited on space. Well, each week, this show is brought to you by great companies that make us uh, possible to come and speak to you Saturday mornings, 9 to 10 a.m. And 
Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at nasala.com. Programming note, tune in next week. If you're a canner, want to be a canner, know somebody who wants to can the food that they pro, uh, they grow or buy at the farmer's market, uh, it's all about canning. What you need to know, what you don't need to, to do to do it safely, as well as master canner from the Milwaukee County. Christina Ward will be with us. She's also released a new book about canning. She will be with us. Uh, so tune in all of that. If you've missed any portion of this show or want to revisit individual interviews or segments, you can find that underneath the highlight uh, section on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website on the right-hand side or full in studio videos and podcasts under the radio tab. Until next week, I'm Holly Baird. And I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.